I am the Fort Bend County Law Librarian and welcome to another attorney lecture series. And we are very grateful to have James Stevens in jo joining us today. And we are going to talk about how to get your criminal appointments here in Fort Bend County specifically. And this is more for new attorneys, but if you haven't renewed your appointments in a while, we'll, you know, we'll cover all that. So welcome, James. And he's been an attorney here for a number of years and uh, well known in criminal circles and here in the courts. So go right ahead. Good afternoon. Well, who knows when you're going to see this, maybe one morning. Now, I'm probably speaking to, you know, half a dozen people, but this is recorded. And so for those that will watch this in the future, I hope I cover some of the questions you may have at that time. Um, when I first thought about doing this, I thought, well, that's only going to take about 10 minutes. But then I realized so like 27 years, there's a lot more to it than, than you think. You know, I, I made just brief notes and I'm like, wow, there's like at least 40 things I've got to mention. But it's not mind boggling. It's just a lot of stuff. Um, we will email everybody two documents, two PDFs. One's 35 pages long and one's 130 two, I think, long. But the one that's 132 long, you don't really have to know all that's in there. That has to do with the public defender's office, uh, who also handle indigent things. But it's when you're working for them, specific things you have to do. Uh, the part I'm basically covering is 35 pages. There's about, uh, well, eight, eight to K, I don't know, like 10 or 11 addendums. Um, so when you download the 35 page document, you can kind of skip the first three or four pages because it's kind of just like an introduction. It's not really telling you how to do anything. Um, <clears throat> but when you get to about the fourth page, after they explain like, how is someone determined to be indigent? That's really not important to us as long as um, somebody has a, a scale and they found someone indigent. Um, so there's minimum qualifications. For misdemeanor, there's three different levels of misdemeanors, and there's several different levels of felony uh, appointments, um, in addition to capital uh, appointments, capital murder appointments. And it all builds and builds. So certainly somebody that is on the top list, excluding capital murder, the 3G list, you're obviously qualified for everything that falls under that. But you could be on a misdemeanor list, and of course not qualified to take any uh, appointments. If somehow you find yourself with a misdemeanor appointment and that's all you're qualified for, and then a, a felony comes up, the general rule is that you handle all of the cases um, for a particular client when something new pops up and something's pending, but it doesn't apply if you're not qualified. Um, you would have to immediately tell the indigent defense people that you're not on the felony list and um, someone will have to take over. And they'll probably take over your misdemeanor as well. Because like I said, usually whoever's on the case handles all of the cases because often pleas wind up being a combination of, you know, a plea with a dismissal or something like that. And things are taken into consideration. But the first thing you have to do, and it's uh, addendum C, is fill out an application. It's straightforward. I hope nobody really needs to take notes because you're going to get all of this in writing. Um, but there is an application. You fill it out, you tell them where you live, where your office is, a whole variety of information. <clears throat> and you turn it in. And you need to turn in with that uh, application, which is addendum C. Um, another addendum, A, and it refers to your continuing legal education, CLE. Now, if you're certified, not everybody that's watching this is going to be a new attorney. You might just be from another county. Um, if you are certified uh, as a you know ex specialist, criminal specialist, you don't have to prove you're uh, you've taken a bunch of CLE. You just have to show them that you are certified, you know, in, in this area, because uh, you can't get certified without having CLE as well. So, but there is um, a certain amount of CLE that's required. And it changes um, depending on the level you're trying to go to from misdemeanor to felony. Um, but after you turn in the application 
and through proof of CLE uh, completed in criminal law within like the last year, uh, or that you're certified, then you move on. Um, addendum H and I only refer to people that are already on the list and they're trying to get recertified. Okay. Um, but to even have your application considered, you're going to have to live in Fort Bend County. Now, the, the way they worded it, they put an or, like an A, B, and then an or. And it should have probably said A or B or C, because um, I know plenty of people that do not live in Fort Bend County, but they have an office in Fort Bend County. So certainly they meant A or B or C. When they say you have to have a residence in Fort Bend County, or you're, they don't have the word or, but or an office in Fort Bend County, or if you don't have an office in Fort Bend County, you have to have a fully executed, legit uh, contract or something with somebody that does have an office in Fort Bend County that is willing to let you use it whenever you need to meet with clients and, and things like that. So it becomes your part-time office and they will ask for that. You're gonna have to prove it. Um, if You've been regularly appearing in Fort Bend County courts for uh, 10 years and don't have an office here and don't live here. They will give you a, a one year grace period to get an office or to move here. Um, but that only applies if you've been, already been continually practicing in Fort Bend County for a decade and now decide you want to start taking appointments, but don't live here, which is easy to do. A lot of people just live nearby in Houston. Um, Okay, first of all, this course is kind of like about how to get on the list, but I'm going to tell you a few things that you have to do should you get on the list. They expect you to visit your client within uh, one business day. Um, I guess if you get appointed on a Friday, you're probably not going to be able to see them until Monday. But if they're in jail, um, you, you need to see them by Monday. They want you to see them by one business day. It's kind of hard to do. Um, most people don't get in trouble if it's a day or two or maybe three um, because the, the clients don't really know you're supposed to be there within 24 hours and there's not much difference between 24 and 36. But if you're continually having clients writing letters to the judge that I've been in here a month and he hasn't visited me yet, then you're going to have an issue. So don't let that happen. Uh, or you could be removed from the list. Um, uh, they say it right in here, calls for indigent arrestees shall be appointed as soon as possible, but not later than the first working day after the judge appoints somebody. You need to see these, these folks. It's not hard to pick up a phone. Now, <clears throat> addendum D is where you request an exclusion from certain kind of cases. There could be something that's so abhorrent to you, maybe sex cases or something that you just can't see yourself ever doing that kind of thing or you've been doing a lot of them and you're tired of it, you could ask to be excluded. Uh, and there's an addendum for that, uh, extended uh, addendum D. Um, once again, that's when you're already on the list and you're trying to get off of one of the lists. You might find that you're just tired of doing felonies and decide just to do misdemeanors, but you have to file something. Uh, I have always been kind of curious as to whether if you file an exclusion, if they're just gonna kind of forget about you. I don't think they do. I'm pretty sure they'll still keep you on the wheel, rotating through there, just not give you those kind of cases. Um, in order to get, uh, there's graduated lists, like I said before, um, misdemeanors have level one, two, and three, then there's felonies, uh, state jail, and and, um, and then third degree, obviously, and you're not gonna get onto the 3G list with the most serious of first degree felonies without having pretty much the most uh, experience. I don't know how many people we have on our wheel. I would guess between 150 and 300, but there's probably only less than 40 people on that 3G wheel. Um, it takes you a while to get on there, unless you've been practicing. Um, addendum A is what you fill out to try to get on the felony list, and everything else, misdemeanors, will automatically be approved if you are approved for any level of felony. Then there's a misdemeanor list, it's addendum B, um, they also expect you to remain on that case through the appellate level. 
Uh, most people don't realize that's in there. But probably 95% of attorneys don't even do appeals. It's kind of a specialty. or So uh, you have to just remember, they can't force you to do the appeal. But when you're finished with a case, withdraw <laughs> so that you, you don't have to worry about the appeal. You file a formal withdrawal. Um, use, your, use some common sense. It was a highly contested uh, trial, and you know the guy's going to want to appeal or might appeal. If you're not going to do it, at least withdraw so they can appoint somebody if the guy needs to appeal. Um, the wheel is on a rotation. Uh, they can skip over people as long as it's within the next five names to get to someone in particular because it, uh, it's not because the judges are playing favorites. It's because they may see a particular need. Um, maybe uh, a particular attorney has handled this guy five times before, and they think it would be best if you know he continued with the same attorney. There could be a variety of reasons, but it's not to play favorites. But they do skip around, but they will get back to you. You won't lose your place in line. Um, expenses. That's a tricky one because I've had uh, expenses for experts that if you file the motion, you know, the court's going to pay for that. But I mean other expenses, like you've got a client that needs something in particular. Um, it used to be you might have to buy them some clothes if you're going to go to trial because they came to court in sh shorts or something or naked. And, I mean, got arrested and they're naked or something. So we kind of solved that by having a lot of people donate clothing to the, our, well, I'll call it our clothing pantry, I guess. Um, and they have a lot of clothes in there. So that's usually not an issue. But there are sometimes some things that you might need to buy. Uh, and I always wondered if I went out and spent $6 or $12, are, are they really reimbursing me? <laughs> Attach that to my voucher? Uh, because one time, a long time ago, I, I may have had a voucher for $500. And uh, spent 30 bucks on something and i had asked the judge did you forget about my 30 dollars you know that i bought shoes or something for somebody and he said no i just decided this time your case was worth 470 and i gave you the 30 dollars uh that's how i came up with 500 even though that for the exact same kind of case you know he always paid me 500 dollars. so are you getting paid i don't know so they do have a, a way that you can get reimbursed but i would suggest that if you really really need uh, reimbursing for something ask first and, and let and let the judge know what you need the money for what you need to buy for this person it might be something totally legitimate um and they'll approve it and then they probably will give you the extra money. but keep your receipts it has to be reasonable and necessary but um i have heard of attorneys spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars and then asking for reimbursement later and then the judge is like the, the guy didn't need a haircut i mean that cost 200 dollars. so be careful um if you're going to be on the list i've already covered that you need to live here have an office here um but you also have to and this should go without saying but you've got to have a phone and an email address i don't know anybody that doesn't have an email address but if you don't have an email address and a phone uh that can be answered between 8 and 6 p.m. And that includes holidays and weekends. Um, you don't have to answer the phone, but they need to be able to leave a message you know, on weekends or holidays. And you have to have an email or you will not be approved because all of our appointments come by email. So you have to be able to respond that you've got it and, and who the client is. If the, there's a, there's a, line in here i don't know what page it's on it's about a quarter of the way through where it says if a judge you're going to turn in a voucher by the way for the felony voucher is slightly different than the the uh, misdemeanor voucher but you turn in a voucher uh, and then did you get paid the judges just look at the hours worked and they decide how much they're going to pay um but the way you read this it seems like we submit an amount that we want and that's not really the way it works 99 percent of the time because it says if the judge disapproves the requested amount, like I've never requested a specific amount ever. Uh, I just tell them how many hours it was and cross my fingers. But it says if they disapprove the amount, the judge will make written findings of why they approved or didn't approve it. 
Um, but basically, we tell we tell them how many hours we work, and they tell us how much we're going to pay. Most of the, I've never worked in another county, but I'm a, on a website, Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and hear people from all over the state complaining about how low they get paid. And I agree, they're not just whiners. If somebody has handled a felony case all the way through a bunch of hearings and the plea, and it's like, and they only pay us four hundred and twenty dollars, like, are you out of your mind? You know, it's like, who works for twenty dollars an hour? That there are counties that are that cheap. Fort Bend County is not cheap. I'd be willing to bet we're right up there in the top two percent of of pay for the indigent uh, clients. It's uh, nothing to, to to sneeze at. It's a fair amount. Um, you can make a living doing <laughs> just court appointments if you if you're busy enough. Um, got a whole lot more though. So there's addendums A through K. The qualification you'll read what you need to qualify uh, to get on the felony list. What you need to qualify to get on, say, the misdemeanor list, and I'll kind of briefly go over them. And you can see that it gets harder and harder to get on a list uh, the higher level you're you're trying to go for. Uh, you can be you can have first degree felony appointments even though they're not 3G. Not all first degrees are 3G, but all 3Gs are are first degree. Uh, if it's a death penalty case where the death penalty is sought, um, there's one sentence in the whole thing. You have to be on the 11th administrative region list. That's it. Hey, don't, they have nothing to do with that. You're either on that list or you're not. And that's not too many people are on that list. Um, but regarding other felonies, um, the higher level you go from state jail and first degree, the more CLE you're going to need, the more um, years experience you'll need, um, and the more trials you will have to have had. You're going to have to show them that you have actually been first chair on some stuff. For instance, uh, all the 3G, the our most serious, I'm excluding capital murder, but all our 3G offenses, you have to have been practicing at least five years. Uh, and you had to have had at least one jury verdict uh, at that level of a 3G offense, or you've been involved in five verdicts, uh, you know, at least three as lead counsel for other first degrees that aren't 3G. Um, First degree felonies other than 3G offenses, you have to have been practicing only four years. And like I said, have one jury verdict at least minimum as first chair on a first degree felony or five on any degree felony. Second and third degrees is as a whole tier in, in amongst themselves. It, you have to be practicing at least two years with one jury verdict as a lead cop, lead, you know, first chair or two as co-counsel on any felonies, or five as lead counsel uh, on any misdemeanors. So you can't actually get a second or third degree appointment without ever having tried a felony if you've had at least five as a lead, lead first chair uh, on a misdemeanor. Uh, state jails, you only require two years of practice and all the other little, a few alternatives, like I said, or, or two that weren't state jails, but there are other felonies, things like that. Appeals, I'm not really going to get into that because if you don't do appeals, uh, and hardly anyone does, you know, you don't even know all this information. But it's there's a there's a page in there telling you how to what you have to do to qualify for appeals. And I suspect, you know, in a nutshell, it's you have to already be doing appeals. They're not going to let you start, you know, your first appeal on an appointing case. They're just not going to do that. Um, but everybody that applies, whether it's to get on the misdemeanor or the felony list, and most people want to get on as many lists as possible. Um, if you want to be on felony misdemeanor and non-appellate appointments, you have, first you have to complete the Fort Bend County Rules of Course CLE course. And uh, I think the library may have that somewhere, or the, there's a website where you can watch that CLE course. And then within, uh, let's see, you have to have had at least 30 hours of CLE 
within the last three years, so that's not too much, in criminal law. So you have to watch the course, have 30 hours of CLE, um, and then after you get approved, annually you have to, you don't have to have 30 hours, you have to have at least 15 a year in order to get recertified amongst other things. But it's 30 to start. Um, There's a few things in here about if you're how to get to be an attorney of the day. Um, that's it's not complicated, but you kind of have to already be on the list uh, already and then try to become an, the attorney of the day. Um, because, like I said, they want someone experienced handling the attorney of the day things so that uh, they can put more properly advise these folks who come to court without an attorney. Uh, there's three levels of misdemeanors. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure out, well, what's a level one and what's a level two and what's a level three? Didn't quite matter to me because I'm uh, on the 3G level, so I'm approved for all of these. But it turns out that what they consider level one um, are all DWIs <laughs> and assault family injuries if it's family violence and crimes of moral turpitude. Um, there, there's six things that you have to do to get on that list. I've tried one of these cases before to a final verdict. Uh, it says have experience in cross-examination, but I don't know how you can be first chair and not have cross-examined, you know, but, but it's in there. You have to have 15 hours of CLE on criminal matters. Um, you also have to have attended a CLE on specifically related to DWIs regarding HDN, blood, blood testing, breath testing, like that, because the level one offices include all DWIs. Um, also, obviously, meet all those other other things so like where your offices. Level two offenses are pretty much all the other class A uh, things that aren't DWI or assault family violence or criminal moral turpitude. Um, and they don't require you to have a jury in that a jury trial in that, but you, as a lead chair, you put, if you're second chair in somebody, uh, that would be good enough. And there's a few other things. So it gets easier and easier. Level three is pretty much just all your class Bs that aren't one of the other ones. Um, that's the only one where all you have to do is have your license. I ask you to just have a license and have 10 hours of CLE in the last uh, six months before you apply, you can do class Bs. Um, well, it's pretty easy to get on that list. There's no huge surprises in the addendums, like the addendum C, which is the application. It's They're going to ask you these things, like um, how many trials have you had and where. They're going to want to know. They will check. <laughs> you know, Now, if you tell them, yeah, I've had like 42 trials in the last three years, they're not going to check them all, but they'll check one or two. And, yeah, okay, obviously the person belongs on the list. Um, but you also have to be in good standing with the bar. That should go without saying, but um, they're going to check with the bar to see if you're in good standing or if you've been suspended lately or something like that, uh, or if you're currently under a suspension. Uh, the addendum D was the exclusion, getting off the list. Some of this. Now, there are two different forms you fill out if you get on this list. How to get paid, you know? Um, they, they're similar, but they do look distinctly different. They clearly say district court at the top of one and uh, county court at the top of the other. And you fill in the blanks. Uh, how many hours in court? How many hours uh, with the trial with testimony? Hours out of court. Most of everything is hours out of court. Talking with client, meeting with the DA, reading an offense report. Most stuff falls in out of court or if you go to court at a regular court setting and it's uh, you know, not a trial or anything, it's just regular court setting and then it winds up getting reset, that just goes under court appearances, no testimony, quarter hour, hour. Um, we're not allowed to charge for travel time. Um, some people do and they probably think they're getting paid for it, but they're not. We've never been allowed to charge for travel time. Um, but all, anything else goes. Now, the district court, you fill out an actual form 
on paper and you turn it into the district clerk and um, you wait for the judge to look at your hours and approve or disprove it. Oh, let me mention one other thing. Some people just go hog wild explaining what they did where it says brief description. Less is better. Um, you don't have to write down every single thing you did. You know, I talked to my client about the this and that and this and that, and that because the judges have to read this. And the more, the harder it is for them to read this, the less attention they're going to pay to your voucher. It's enough to say reviewed offense report or, or reviewed discovery, watch the DVD. Now, sometimes I'll put in parentheses actual time. If a DVD is an hour and 54 minutes long, um, I write in there real time one hour, 54 minutes. So the judge will understand why it took me two hours to watch it because it's gonna take you longer than just the real time because you're stopping it and rewinding it. Did he say, what did he say? You know, and you're rewinding it. So it lets the judge know that it took me two and a quarter hours because the thing running start to finish alone was in, you know, an hour and 57 minutes. So right in the real time, but less is more phone contact with client regarding blank. But some people want to fill up every single spot in here and you can barely read the writing. Less is better. Um, now, the other one that's for misdemeanors, generally, you're only going to use that for uh, juveniles because the same form, basically it's 99% the same way, is online. The misdemeanor things are filed online uh, as opposed to the felony. That could probably be a whole, in fact, at one point in time, it was a whole class in and of itself of how to file a voucher online. It gets a little complicated, but once you've done it once or twice, then it becomes a breeze. Oh, also, in order to get um, on the list, I forgot, you, you're going to have to, besides have your own email address, be proficient in how to e-file because a lot of stuff is e-filed nowadays, um, including some, some courts want their resets e-filed and some courts want you to email them a reset. Um, so you have to be proficient in e-filing and you also have to know how to operate the um, evidence, the, the portal, the Odyssey portal, so they can send you discovery and offense reports. They'll never send, they never do send anything that's digital some as an attachment or something to the portal. If you need a DVD, they're gonna go, you have to go to the, their office and pick it up and bring them a replacement DVD. Sometimes a flash drive. Um, but that's one of the boxes you have to check off on the application. I'm proficient in how to use the Odyssey portal and I have signed up for it and got on it. Um, and I also know how to e file things. And I have found that when you do get around, and this might help you out, Ralph, if you didn't know, um, the when we e-file now, uh, they had a system in place and then they kind of upgraded it to make it better. I don't know, six months ago or eight months ago. But when you first log on, it asks you, we have a new version and click here, or it'll say, or do you want to use the old one? I always use the old one. And uh, it is, it's the same thing, <laughs> but it is way more user friendly. And I can file a motion and an order and then follow it up with a reset in like four minutes. Whereas stumbling through the other one, it might take you 15 minutes of document. Um, I don't know why they thought they were improving it, but when given a choice on the e-filing, click the old part where it says, do you want to use the old version? Way more easier to navigate. It's the exact, does the exact same thing. Um, once you have gotten on the list. There's an addendum H for how to get recertified. Of course, um, you don't have to have 30 hours of, of CLE, but you do have to have 15 in, in criminal law. And that's not hard to get considering how often free stuff is offered. Most people have way more than enough and you can carry stuff over to the next year too, uh, if you have too much. Um, so there is such thing as getting recertified you can't just go forever without having any trials, though, even if you've got a whole bunch. You're going to have to have a trial occasionally to stay on that list. Um, there's, a, for some reason, there's, I'm going to mention it, there's an addendum J, which you will see uh, in Odyssey and stuff like that when they send you all the discovery. 
and somewhere somewhere in here after they've uh you know magistrate has read up the person all their rights and asked them if they explain but a lot of times under remarks it'll say see attachment often that attachment is supposed to be something that says and it's usually when it's family violence like you can't go near the residence or things like that stay away provisions like but the attachment is never attached I, i've never found one yet um so be careful if it says see attached it probably means there's more conditions even though they haven't put them on tyler Paul. now i can't believe i'm gonna have to say this because a year ago or last March, I would have thought, ah, give them a week or two. But Tyler Paw, they're probably in every single county, uh, is how we look up everything that's filed in the county and district courts. They keep track of everything. Um, if you want to know if the person's indicted, you used to be able to put in their name or the case number. Boop, here, there it is. Uh, you have everything you wanted to know. And where it says indictment, it used to be highlighted in blue. Anything that was filed, you click on it, and all of a sudden you're seeing a picture of the indictment. Download it, read it, whatever. Or if there's a bond, you could click on the bond papers, you see the bond papers, and it'll tell you the rest of the day he got out, which is important because you want to know how much jail credit he has without having to drive all the way to the jail and ask them, you know. Or you might want to see the bond papers and see who his co-signer was. Because you can't find this guy and you're trying to find someone that might know where the guy is. Well, approximately last April or March, Tyler Paul lost the capability to be able to click on a document and read it. And I don't think that anyone realized how often the defense attorneys used that. I don't have the hugest practice uh, in Fort Bend County, but it's definitely considered a robust practice. And I probably use Tyler Paw, and I don't know why, but I always call it Tiger Paw. It just sounds good. But I use Tyler Paw, or was, 30 times a day, like every single day. Uh, I'd want to know, oh, I needed to see the indictment. I want to see the bond papers. I'm trying to find somebody. There's, there's a lot of, you want to see how many times this guy's been arrested before and what and what happened uh, if it, in Fort Bend County. It's a way to get a local criminal history. And they told us in April of 2021, it'll be fixed in a week or two. And then in May, they said it's right around the corner. Well, today's December 10th. It's been probably 10 months, nine months that this system is down. It's not enough just to know that if somebody filed something, who cares? Uh, you want to be able to read what they filed. We can't, we, we do not have that capability. Um, I don't know why it's not fixed, but it needs to get fixed. But um, when it does get fixed, <laughs> for those of you that get on the list, you start practicing out here, it's a super good tool that we'll, you will use often. I hope it gets fixed for 2022, though. Um, the, the judges only, I, I probably should have, mentioned this earlier, but, but the judges also only approve things um, like I think the, the appointments for this coming year had to be in, at least sub submitted, by October the 15th each year. So if you're trying to get on a list for 2022, it's too late. But for some people, they might not be able to uh, get on the list anyway because they still need to get in a trial or something or get in some more CLE they didn't know they needed. Um, but it's well worthwhile to get on that list. And um, they could change the rules too. Who knows? Maybe maybe next July we'll be short on people and they'll say, well, we're going to take applications early this year. But um, for now, anybody that applies, it won't be considered until October of next year. You have to wait like we're like 11 months behind the ball. Um, don't be late on that though. Some people might be watching this video next September. Get it in before, I believe it's October the 15th. Um, I'd say October 1st, just to be sure, but uh, get it in so they can get it approved. They may have a question you need to get back to them. Um, I am going to send all of this 35 pages, 
which is long, but it's e easy to read. I'll send it to uh, the, the law library. And I'm also going to attach that other one that's 132 pages long. Don't print it out. It's pretty much exclusively for the public defender's office. And um, they would train you on that if they hired you anyway, so you don't need to know that. But I'll send it all to Andrew. He's got everybody's email addresses. And then he'll email it back. Um, we have a few minutes, so let me just mention, we did talk about the pay before. Um, no, nobody's going to pay somebody $50 an hour for legitimate work. You can, you will be paid appropriately and the, the usually, <laughs> and the higher the offense, uh, maybe the more they're going to pay. Uh, certainly they're going to pay somebody, I'll just say $150 an hour, they're working on a murder, but they might not pay $150 on a shoplift, but they might, you know, you never know. Uh, but the judges almost, for the most part, all used to be defense attorneys or prosecutors. They know how long things really take to do. If you turn in some bill for 56 hours on some simple shoplift, they're going to look at it and think, you didn't even have a trial. How would you do this much work? So be realistic. Um, don't put 10 phone calls at a quarter hour apiece, you know, in two days, because nobody's going to talk on the phone for two and a half hours with a client. Be realistic. Uh, most phone calls with the client usually last about two or three minutes. But I will put... You know, spoke to the client on the phone, you know, like three times on one line, three times in that one day, and put a quarter hour hold. You know, because they're going to know when you're exaggerating, because maybe they used to exaggerate uh, themselves. So they, they, they'll they bust you. <laughs> so be realistic with your hours and those vouchers, and they will pay you appropriately. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Or Andrew, can you think of a potential question someone might have had that didn't come? Yeah, let me go ahead and unmute everybody here. You'll have to manually unmute yourself, but you now have permission. Are you finding that you're required to submit uh, all of your vouchers ele electronically prepared? We've had several rejected because portions of them were handwritten. The, the um, felonies can be handwritten. Some people have managed to download the thing and make it into like an electronic version of the exact same thing. And I think they accept those. But they're also, you can handwrite all felonies if you want. You know, I've never electronically filed a felony yet, handwriting. The misdemeanors, you can't ever turn in one handwritten. They will not ever accept the misdemeanor handwritten. It's all electronic. The okay. only misdemeanors that can, that have to be written out uh, are the juveniles, which uh, is the same form uh, as the misdemeanors, but it has to be handwritten. And for some reason, you swear to the misdemeanors and you have to swear to the juvenile things. But when you turn in a felony voucher, which is usually much more complicated and expensive, like you don't even have to swear that it's true, but. So the felonies can be handwritten. Misdemeanors must be all electronically completed. Yes, and there's the, no court that accepts a handwritten misdemeanor voucher anymore. Now, some of them will let you do an email, I mean, a, a email, which is basically a handwritten a reset, but other courts now are demanding e-filed resets. But that's not what we were talking about, but. They're still switching around. I think eventually every court is going to want us to e-file the resets. And I hated it at first, but then as soon as I figured out how easy it is, you especially after you've reset a person one time, I pull up the old one um, that they sent me back with the new date on it. And I use the erase mode, erase everything, and um, change the date that I'm submitting it, and I'm done. You know, So it goes faster and faster. Um, but they know it doesn't take an hour to send in a a reset. So like I said, don't exaggerate on the forms. They know how long things basically take. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Oh, since some of you, you know, here don't have a question, but down the road, someone might have a question. My name is James Stevens. My email is 
like my last name, Stevens, S-T-E-V-E-N-S, Stevens for the defense. All I do is defense and, and juvenile work. Um, if you have a question, you can always email me. Um, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Stevens for the defense at gmail.com. Uh, but I also have a, a lot of experience maybe the most, I don't know, uh, as being an attorney of the day or an attorney of the month. Um, and if anyone ever has a question about what they do or how do you get in touch with an attorney of the day if you need some help because your client's in jail and he's he's got court on a misdemeanor jail docket, you know, email me, I'll answer your questions. I may even be AOD that week, probably with me. Excellent. You said all juvenile vouchers are handwritten on unless, the somebody has, form. Yeah, unless somebody has just somehow managed to make their own electronic version. Um, and sometimes they will accept something like that. But and they have to be hand delivered. Misdemeanor right. voucher has to be on their form on the computer. It's on the county's website. Okay. It's pretty user friendly. So long as you remember that once you electronically put your signature on there, at that point. Even if you haven't transmitted, once your signature's on it, you can't edit anything. So read it over two or three times before you put your signature on it, because at that point you have to submit mm -hmm. it. Okay. Also, I think the most a lot of people don't realize this, don't care, maybe, but the when you do it electronically on the misdemeanor vouchers, it rounds up. 0.25 becomes 0.3. You know, uh 0.75. 0.8 they round up the tenths you can do tenths so that's another reason why I don't exaggerate too much on uh, uh, how long a phone call really took because three tenths of an hour is 18 minutes like took you 18 minutes to call the client to tell them don't forget you have court tomorrow I mean that's not realistic um so maybe put point one point two because if you point put a quarter hour and it rounds up to three they'll be like Oh, wait, did it take that long? Just use some sense. And I've even had times where I put stuff in there, no charge. If something took one minute. And some judges actually appreciate the honesty. That's like, call the client. And I just put, to tell them, so NC or N, no charge in the line. I documented that I called them, but I didn't even charge. And they appreciate the honesty. They know you're not going to be cheating them here and there if you're not even billing for everything you did. Although you've that's that's when it's like a minute. I don't bill for a minute. Mr. Stevens, do you transfer all of your time entries regarding your casework onto the voucher, or do you just enter a C attached invoice? Where I never do a C attached invoice. I beg your pardon. I never do a C attached invoice. Really? It takes more effort to do that than it does to. I have an Excel spread, most Excel sheet, whatever you want, mm -hmm. A through. Z, or you probably do double A or something. Andrew probably know about, more about that than me. But in A, I put the date. B, the client's name. C, I stretch it out a little bit and put what I did. You know, D is how many hours it was. Um, and it serves as a retroactive calendar where I was. And sometimes I'll even put some future dates when I know to make sure I don't forget about something. So it's kind of like the Excel sheet becomes my calendar. But once you... Um, track of it every day I'm, I'm making an entry oh i just hung up with somebody i click on the excel sheet and you know do whatever i did file a motion hour you know and uh later when it's time to bill for that person it's as simple as control f find that name and uh you can pull out all over a course of a year year and a half all those entries for that one person now all of a sudden you pull them out on their own little separate sheet and they're in chronological order. You just hit that one function to reverse it because we we put them in reverse order. You know, the, the first thing is the is the oldest thing that you did. And and you just fill it all in. It's so easy. The, the C attached to me takes longer. When I mean, you've already got all that information in there, you had to have pulled that information from somewhere. Um, I don't know. I just like doing it that way <laughs> and and you know somebody actually somebody can actually do the handwriting for the attorney 
if you've pulled it all out and it's on your Excel sheet, it's printed nice and neatly. You don't even have because you can't bill for filling out the forms. You can't bill like it took me one hour to do the voucher. We can't bill for doing our vouchers, but it still takes time. But when um, I have it on the Excel sheet and, and can yank out that one particular person and print it out, uh, my secretary could just literally sit there and on the handwritten box. You know, it's pretty simple to do. Or you could, like I said, do the C attached, but I just really like that C attached. Anything that's out of the ordinary, they push off and they'll get to it later. So later might be two months. Anything else? We kind of got it. Uh, got into some stuff about, well, I guess this was supposed to be how to apply to get on the thing, but the vouchers are definitely um, part of being on the list because every, every, oh, let me mention this. When occasionally you have a client that becomes a bond forfeiture and you like, don't see him for a month or two or three, <laughs> you you can't turn in your voucher until you're done. Um, so generally, if a guy's been a bond forfeiture for a year, I'll ask the judge, you know, I have like a whole bunch of work on this case and have not seen this guy for a year. The judge may let you turn in an interim bill and you write right on it, interim bill. And then the last line put, you know, made attempts to find the guy and, you know, and the judge will pay you there. But other than that, um, they don't pay you until the case is over and a month or two, it's not enough to get an interim bill. But if a guy's been missing for a year and a half, just the other day, I, uh, as attorney of the day, I saw a case number and it was like from 2013. And I thought, wow, I guess it took him a while to file this motion to revoke probation. Scott, <laughs> turns out the case had never even been completed. He's been a bond forfeiture for eight years. Um, and I looked under the Tyler Paw and noticed uh, wow, that attorney went to court like nine times for this guy. He had a whole bunch of stuff to read and he had never turned in a bill. He probably ne didn't even remember he represented this guy because it was a misdemeanor. Um, and he was quite happy when I called him as attorney of the day, like, hey, your guy finally got arrested. And don't forget to, you know, you, you need to turn in a bill for like about 10 or 12 hours. It was like a Christmas gift for the, for the guy. You can forget to uh, make yourself known uh, when these guys become bond forfeitures to eventually turn in a bill because it can turn into a significant amount of money. The county probably owed that attorney somewhere because this actually was two cases, one from 2013 and one from 16. Probably owed him a couple of thousand dollars and he completely forgot about it. Um, try not to do that. <laughs> James. Yeah, it's not Robert. Hey, how are you? So, uh, have have any of the courts added any particular? Have they made any particular changes, uh, particular to that court, or just say, for example, a misdemeanor court? The misdemeanor judges have decided something uh, that's going to apply to them from this point onward, or the felony judges as well. Not as far as getting on the list or the wheel, um, but they are kind of occasionally adjusting. Uh, at first, it was just one court that made you e-file resets. And now it's two courts, it's the 434th and the 458th, for instance. Everybody else lets you just uh, email. Um, but as far as getting on the wheel, no. Now, there, if you're a Spanish speaker, uh, not, not just a little bit, if you really can speak Spanish, um, you will wind up getting extra appointments because very few of our lawyers uh, speak Spanish, not even 10%. It's, it's probably... 3% or something. And so let's say there's 100 people on the wheel and you're number 40. Um, and there's, you're not even close to being next on the list. They will jump ahead and give you the Spanish speaker, but then put you back in line for the English speakers. Um, you don't lose your place just because you had to do that. So you will actually get significantly more if you speak Spanish. Um, just because they don't take you out of line. Um, they just skip ahead to you, get get you, and then put you back where, where, where you were, and you get the next English speaker, perhaps. Um, if you find that you're appointed on a felony, 
and someone else is appointed on the misdemeanor. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Um, you can just let the misdemeanor person handle the misdemeanor, but I would suggest having a conversation with them about don't do anything until I'm done. Um, because you always want to resolve the felony first um, down the road. But generally, they'll give it back to you uh, unless you just don't care. Um, but one person is supposed to handle all the cases. Sometimes they get messed up because like uh, a guy goes to jail as Joe Perez, and then he's in jail also under Joe Albert Perez, and they think it's two different people. So they get it to two different people. But one person, whoever has the oldest case or the highest level, uh, is, is supposed to handle handle everything for that one particular person. Also, down the road, after you've represented somebody and maybe saw it through all the way to a probation or a deferred adjudication, you'll uh, at some point somebody's going to get revoked. They'll file an MRP or an MAG, and you'll see your name next to the client's name on one of the monitors in the hallway. And you're like, I don't represent that guy. 95% of the time, they forget to take your name off a case because you never withdrew. Um, but they will, there will be a separate appointment to a different attorney usually when it's a motion to adjudicate or a motion to revoke. If you wind up getting appointed to that guy or girl who's got a motion to revoke uh, and you handle it before, it's coincidence. You know, they don't automatically give it back to the initial attorney. The name is just on there because they forgot to you never filed a motion to withdraw. Like you were saying. Anything else? Ralph, any other, any other, cover? No, I'm good. Any other questions? I have none. Ralph, you got might not have a question because because you and I've been around a while. But is there something I missed that you can remember? No, not really. The only thing is that I agree with you. The Tyler cost suck. Uh, the before. It was a tool that we could use, and it was very, very efficient. At the present time, we have this code and password and get around that, but it doesn't work half the time. I've spoken to the district clerk, and she just kind of just brushes it off, and I don't think it'll ever be fixed. I agree. I think they have zero idea of how much we use it and rely on it. It's, like I said, something I probably use, was using, 15 to 30 times every single day. And when I need the information, I need it right then. That's why I'm clicking on it. Yeah. Same goes, I mean, I don't do criminal appointments, obviously I'm here in the law library, but we use Tyler Paw, you know, all the time and trying to assist people who come into the law library. They're like, you know, just to get an idea of what's going on in their case. And we'll look on there and, you know, or people are like, hey, can I open my document? And they're, yeah, this has been frustrating for, like you said, it's hard to believe it's been nine months. Yeah, well, yeah. and there's people, it's some kind of uh, software issue or something, but there's probably 15 year old hackers out there that can fix it in 10 minutes. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, if you can hack into the na national defense somehow, if you're a genius, I mean, I don't know how it could be so hard to fix this. Well, what's amazing is, and what's hopeful is, at least they, somebody was saying, I'm not saying this, somebody was saying, oh, this is their way of, they're going to make us start paying for everything. They're going to make us pay for this and pay for that. And I was like, I, I left that alone. Right. I don't know. I left it alone. Yeah, but it's public, it's public information. It's not secret. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I mean, but to me, you have to drive all the way down there during business hours just to look at a document. That's that is. Yeah, it, it, they can be, they've been very good about redacting addresses, redacting phone numbers. And that's that's fine. I'm okay with it. Mm. Okay, so down the road, someone's watching this in a month or in six months or a year. If you have a question, hopefully I'm, I'll still be alive. Stevens for the defense <laughs> at gmail.com. Just send me an email. I'll answer it. AOD questions or or about how to do a voucher. Um, I didn't know it all when I started. I just know a lot now over the course of time. Thanks, Ty. Do you have any experience, any time delays? with some of the courts and approving vouchers and moving them? Sometimes they'll be approved within a week or 10 days. Sometimes it takes a couple of months, but in general, month is probably average. General, 
Uh, it's much so, better now than it was before when Elliot and Culver were there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had some judges in the past that if you ever had to go to their office for anything at all and you glanced over to the right, you'd see a stack of like 150 district court files that they haven't gotten to yet because they only want to do them once a quarter or once every six months. And that was outrageous. Yeah. Most of the judges are pretty fast now, but they have their own delays. And we don't know when they're on vacation and stuff. But if you're routinely turning in one or two vouchers a month, you'll, after the first month goes by, you'll start getting one or two checks a month. And they'll automatically deposit that check too. If they ask you, do you want to sign up for it? Yes. The yes. ACH, yes. It's fast. It's a lot faster too. You'll get it faster. And they exactly. just automatically deposit. Exactly. Saves your trip to the bank. Anything else? I think we're we're good, yeah. then, Andrew. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And I hope you either uh, refreshed your memory on a certain things or learned something new. And where is uh, this library, this public the <laughs> library? We're in the in the courthouse in the justice. You are center. in the courthouse. Yep. Second on floor. Second on what floor? Second, second floor. floor. Okay. And it is very That's user friendly, good. very Texas good, good, so good public resource. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the people that work there know more than you think. Yeah, they do. They, they've been around. Um, Thank you, James. They have. That was my office practically until COVID hit because I'd be in the courthouse all day in between settings i'd run right over there and start doing stuff yeah. uh, COVID kind of put a big damper on that but I, they still remember me i get in there at least a little bit once a week yeah. come back <laughs> that's yeah, good i may come over for a tour one day absolutely come on over right. oh yeah. this James, is one thing andrew James. didn't mention but people should know know this some people have uh oh, what's the ralph what's the name of the uh the program that you know auto auto fills all your forms um products product thing there are things like product and other things that do that but they're not called that um and then there's lexus nexus and some people are all proud that they we pay i don't know i'll just make up a number like 500 dollars a month and we get this and this and this and we can look up anything this and this and this well i'll tell you right now that unless you're i don't know maybe fulbright Jaworski or something no law office in Fort Bend County and probably Harris County, no regular law office has the services that the Fort Bend County Law Library pays for True. every month, every year. Um, from you think of it, Westlaw, Lexus, Nexus, for these things, they subscribe to everything there is. I don't think there's anything they don't subscribe. What does it cost? Like a hundred thousand dollars a year or something? I'm, you don't have to say the amount. That, it's an it's an enormous amount. One of them. Jesus. It's an enormous amount, yeah. be, and they have all those things. There's nothing you have at your office they don't also have there, except they have ten times as much. Yeah, the the only thing we really don't subscribe to is Bloomberg, which does a lot of uh, tax and corporate litigation resources that uh, doesn't generally dollars. happen out here. So yeah. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, we got it, and we yeah. have access to that. Is what you're saying? Yes, you doesn't do. cost you anything. Eight to it's five, okay. Monday through Friday. Interesting. Okay. And I will plug. We do have another attorney lecture series, and we actually have our open house, which will be celebrating our 32nd anniversary of the Fort Bend County Law Library on January 14th. It's a Friday. We are going to be having three free CLEs that day, um, including one hour of ethics for the uh, attorney lecture series that day. We are going to be focusing on probate law and guardianships. So while that may not be an area of practice for some of you here today, um, please be aware it is three free hours of CLE that you can use for your continuing education courses uh, for the year. And the first class will be at 10 a.m. on that day, January 14th. The second one at 11 a.m. And the third one will be at 2 p.m. in the afternoon.